Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our series of discussions with Madawi Al Rashid. She joins us again from London. Thanks for joining us, Madawi. Thank you. Once again, Madawi is a visiting professor at the Middle East Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. So, in part one of these, this interview series, we talked about the Saudi stakes in Yemen. Uh, but as most countries, domestic politics sometimes is the most important determining factor about external policy. So today we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about the situation in Saudi Arabia. Um, what, first of all, let, let's talk about the Shia in Saudi Arabia. First of all, as you mentioned in part one, the Saudis have incurred a couple of times actually in Bahrain to help the Bahraini monarchy suppress the rebellion there, or uh, protests. Um, there's a large uh, minority Shia population in Saudi Arabia, and it happens to be very strategically located right where most of the oil is. Um, in, incurring this, the Yemen incursion, as the Houthis are Shia, uh, how does this play out in terms of Saudi domestic politics? I think um, the, the Saudi Shia started a kind of uprising protest movement, but they were suppressed. and. Uh, uh, until sort of recently, they continued to stage uh, very small demonstrations in their villages in the eastern province where the oil installations are and the oil fields. But uh, they, they failed to uh, create any kind of uh, cross-sectarian solidarities. And the reason for this is that the Saudi government adopted the view uh, that any kind of dissent in the country must be regarded as an Iranian conspiracy against Saudi Arabia. And the Shia were accused of being a fifth column loyal to Iran and trying to destabilize Saudi Arabia. But the intervention in Yemen has much to do with the majority of Saudis and the situation among those ones. For four years, Saudi Arabia has been trying uh, to present itself as the leader of the Sunni community, the Sunni community worldwide. And at the same time, Saudi Arabia has failed to actually make that into a reality. And its own Islamists uh, were targeted when they started some kind of agitation, but very minor ones. Saudi Arabia introduced uh, a new um, anti-terrorism laws that criminalized almost all Islamists. And one of them is the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi Arabia, which is affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and other Islamist movements. It suppressed those, and quite a lot of people were not able to uh, voice any kind of dissent as a result of these new ter anti-terrorism uh, uh, de royal decrees. But at the same time, Saudi Arabia wants those Islamists to support it because they are very loud in, in calling upon the, their brothers everywhere uh, to support a kind of Sunni Islamist revival uh, in order to limit and repel the Iranian Shiite expansion. So this new war that the Saudi kings seem to be very keen on uh, responds to that domestic demand. Saudi Arabia is also losing almost its credentials when it is facing the challenge known as ISIS. This particular state that emerged in June declared itself to be the caliphate under Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi presents a real challenge for Saudi Arabia because the, the caliphate of al-Baghdadi presents itself as defender of Sunni Muslims. And this is exactly what it's been doing in Iraq and in Syria, whereas the Saudi regime, who wants to be the defender of the Sunni, is incapable of doing anything. So Saudi, the Saudi regime finds itself uh, competing with this ISIS uh, among the local constituencies, among Sunni Muslims in Saudi Arabia. And therefore, by launching this war, Saudi, the Saudi regime has silenced dissent among Islamists, which represent a substantial a, a majority in Saudi Arabia. It seems like the, the policy is very <coughs> contradictory, particularly towards Iraq and ISIS, in the sense that the, the IS is fighting, to a large extent, Shia militias, an Iraqi government that's very sympathetic to Iran. Um, even a, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard are actually sending you know, commanders and other kinds of support to, to fight IS. 
um, which, I, which in a sense is that converges with some of the interests of the Saudis in terms of IS. On the other hand, there's a lot of interest converging between IS and the Saudis to try to fight Shia slash Iranian-backed forces. Yes, absolutely. Well, the politics of the Middle East, the politics of Saudi Arabia in particular, and other regional powers are not straightforward. They do not follow a particular logic. They are momentary decisions that uh, seek to achieve uh, limited goals. Uh, and if those goals are not met, then they move to the next target. But as you said, uh, Paul, uh, the, the contradiction is there. Uh, the contradiction and the competition between multiple actors is there. And I think we just observe this politic as it unfolds without actually uh, 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 having a clear idea where it's going to lead. What we know, it has led to death and destruction in the, in the area, from Syria all the way down to Yemen now. Um, but the interesting thing about uh, the, 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 this sort of convergence between Saudi Arabia and ISIS, have you noticed, Paul, that since the beginning of the uh, airstrikes on Yemen, it's almost now seven days, neither uh, ISIS nor al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is located in southern Yemen, had actually said anything. We do not know what they're thinking. Are they thinking that, well, this is great, Saudi Arabia is providing cover for us, or is Saudi Arabia bombing us in, in Syria and helping us in Yemen? So there is a quite a big, a big question mark about this convergence of interest, because they fight the same enemy. Uh, ISIS and Saudi Arabia regard Iran and the Shia as their enemy. Some of the, anal uh, some of the analysts I've talked to suggest that the contradiction between the Saudis and ISIS is mostly smoke and mirrors, that it's rhetorical, that there's a, there is still really some kind of alliance between them, prior to Yemen even, in the sense that there may still be some financing and support. That, I mean, more or less, we, I think most people assume there was early support for IS-type forces and IS itself in the fight against uh, Assad in Syria. But even now, that it's, it's more a war of words. And, and in fact, they, they like the fact that I, I, IS is fighting uh, Shia in our, our Iranian-backed forces in Iraq. Yes, of course. I mean, that is so obvious. They have common enemy. They have a common enemy. Uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, was accused of uh, uh, supporting ISIS or other groups such as Jabhat al-Nusra or Ahrar al-Sham, and they're all rebel groups that have mushroomed and popped up in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, but the interesting thing is, why is ISIS silent on the uh, uh, airstrikes in Yemen? And why is Al-Qaeda in Yemen, in southern Yemen, uh, that has some kind of affinity with ISIS, but also some differences? Why are they both silent when Saudi Arabia is bombing Yemen? I, I, I have a big question mark, and I still wait to hear uh, a declaration or a, a word from these groups that are extremely active on the Internet. They, are, uh, they, they keep posting their YouTube videos uh, and giving com running a commentary on, uh, on the, uh, the regional affairs. Of uh, uh, the affairs of the region. Well, there's a. I mean, I, I guess what you're getting at is a kind of de facto alliance there. I would call it common interest. But again, you know, they 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 had been very very close. I mean, we only need to go back to the 1980s when Saudi Arabia, together with other Western powers, were actually uh, promoting jihad in Afghanistan, and that led to the creation of Al Qaeda. So they were their allies. In fact, they were working on behalf of these superpowers and the regional ones, such as Saudi Arabia. And only after the liberation of Afghanistan, they fell out. And this is very, very common. And I hope, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat itself in this uh, uh, particular uh, time, because I hope that governments had learned a lesson from playing with fire. Well, there's no reason to think so. I mean, it's, it seems the Saudis have been playing this double game, as you said, at least from the the Afghan war. I mean, we'll have to keep reminding everybody because the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about it, but the joint congressional investigation into 9-11, 28 pages that were redacted from the report specifically accused the Saudis, in fact, the Saudi government, of facilitating and financing the 9-11 attacks. 
So this, this double game, the relationship with Al-Qaeda on the one hand and, and supposedly allying itself with, uh, you know, with various Western anti-terrorist activities, uh, this has been going on a long time. But also, Paul, I would like to mention that there is a very loyal, uh, a royal element in the war on Yemen. And the royal uh, element stems from the fact that we have a new leadership in Saudi Arabia since January, when King Abdullah died and his brother King Salman came to power. He managed to place his youngest son, Mohammed bin Salman, in the highest position. He's a minister of defense, head of the royal court. He, it, uh, he, he basically has so many powers at the moment. And at the same time, we have his cousin, Mohammed bin Naif, who heads the Ministry of Interior. He's more senior and he's had more experience because he claims that he's the one who actually uh, destroyed Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia. And he's the one who managed to control terrorism in Saudi Arabia. And his methods of dealing with terrorists are copied by, inter by other governments uh, and also acclaimed by the United Nations. So he's established his cr credential as the security man in Riyadh for the internal security. But um, Hamad bin Salman, the new uh, minister of uh, defense, he's only 30 years old and he hasn't established his credentials. And therefore, this war uh, reminds me of what happened to his uh, cousin, Khalid bin Sultan, in the 1990s, uh, when he fought uh, in Kuwait with General Schwarzkopf and claimed that he was the uh, desert warrior. And so there is this mythology about Khalid bin Sultan, who was the minister of defense at the time. And now I think Muhammad, the young son of the king is trying to achieve some kind of victory in order to uh, achieve some kind of balance and equality with his uh, uh, cousin Muhammad bin Naif who heads the Ministry of Interior. So there is this particular uh, 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 very very royal politics at play and at the moment the war uh, on Yemen broke out we see images flooding the Saudi media showing this young minister of defense who is still inexperienced. He has his unknown quantity yet, and he is uh, uh, desperate for a victory in Yemen in order to uh, assert his credentials vis-a-vis -vis his cousin. Right. Okay, we're going to continue our discussion in the next uh, segment in this series of interviews with Madawi Al-Rashid on the Real News Network. Please join us.